Okay guys, uh, welcome to the session. So we are now going to start off with IFRS 16 leases. Let me just give you a bit of a background about leases and its significance at this level. For all the SBR students, you have already studied leases at the FR level. And uh, when it comes to the SBR, again, it's an important area of accounting. And it has got more accounting aspects uh, which are actually going to be tested at this SBR level. From the perspective of the exam, the examiner may ask you a 7 mark, may ask you a 10 mark uh, question on leases or may not even ask you a single question on leases. It's not a mandatory question, it's not a mandatory area. But the examiner may actually ask you 7 mark, 10 mark, 5 mark on a leases which would be a discursive question with some calculations involved also. So we are going to start off and uh, if I could just recall a quick about these leases, so you would recall from your general concept, from your understanding, that what exactly is a lease agreement. So the lease agreement basically includes two people. And what are those people? One of them is called a lessee. And the other one of them is called lesser. So when we talk about the lease agreement, so with respect to a lease agreement, you've got a lessee and you've got a lesser. Now, who exactly is a lessee? Who exactly is the lesser? So simply the owner of an asset is a lesser. And who is a lessee? The tenant, the person to whom the right to use the asset has been conveyed is considered to be a lessee. So generally speaking, what happens is that the lesser allows the lessee or the lesser conveys the right to use the lesser conveys the right to use the asset to a lessee in exchange for a certain payment. That is what is considered to be a lease agreement. So this IFRS 16 actually deals with the accounting in the books of lessee. It deals with the accounting in the books of lesser. And in addition to this, there are some other types of accounting, which is a manufacturer dealer lesser or there is actually a transaction where the sale and lease back transactions are discussed. So IFRS 16 discusses about different, different types of transactions. So we are going to discuss, we are going to take each one of them one by one and take things forward. So first of all, <clears throat> I'm actually going to uh, give you a few examples of the lease that what are the different type of examples of the lease agreement. Something which is very common, which is when you obtain the house on rent or when you have uh, when you have a house on rent similarly there is a situation when you have got car which is taken on rent the third type of category is that when you have got an office which is taken on rent so there could be different different type of examples that could exist with respect to the lease and practically there are two types of leases that we face in our real life situation one of them is basically a lease that we enter into with a leasing organization or we enter into with a bank. And what exactly is that type of lease agreement? That is a type of lease agreement where we actually, what we do is that we either obtain a car or we obtain a house usually and we obtain those car and houses on installments from the banks or we obtain these uh, car and houses from the leasing companies on installments. And what we actually do is that we continuously keep on paying them installments for two year, five year, 10 year, 20 year, depending upon the size of the financing involved, depending upon the value of the asset which we have taken on lease. So we, can, we, we actually continuously keep on paying the installment, continuously paying installment, installment, installment. And ultimately what happens is that the ownership gets transferred in our name. So that is one type of lease agreement. So what is that one type of lease agreement? A lease agreement where what we do is that we obtain an asset from a leasing company or some financial institution or some bank. We constantly pay installments and ultimately the ownership gets transferred to us. And then there is this different other type of lease where you would actually go into some random person or you would actually bump into a company, etc, etc. And you would, you would rent out anything. It could be office, it could be house, 
it could be land, it could be vehicle, etc., etc. And what you do is that you continuously keep on paying rent for it. I repeat, you continuously keep on paying rent for it. And when you keep on paying rent for it, so ultimately what happens is that uh, after a certain period of time, maybe one year, two year, three year, when you stop using that asset, the asset goes back to the lesser. The ownership does not transfer. The ownership does not transfer. Generally speaking, such type of leases where the ownership transfers are considered to be finance lease. And the leases where the ownership does not transfer, they are considered to be operating lease. So practically what happens is that you would use these terminologies a lot which is finance lease, which is operating lease. And the whole concept, the whole objective, the whole idea of this finance lease, operating lease is that generally when the ownership transfers, it's considered to be finance lease. And when the ownership does not transfer, it's considered to be operating lease. That's how things are. Now, but again, from the perspective of IFRS 16, the use of terminology of finance lease the use of terminology of operating lease is something that you would have to uh, that you would have to be very careful because it depends upon for whom are you doing the accounting are you doing the accounting for lessee or are you doing the accounting for lesser so it is actually going to be dependent upon whom are you accounting for if it's lessee the terminologies used are different if it is lesser the terminologies used are a bit different so we are going to take them one by one we are going to discuss them one by one and we're going to keep uh, moving ahead with the leases concepts. Okay, um, so here is a definition of leases in accordance with IFRS 16. And when we talk about the definition of leases in accordance with IFRS 16, so it says a lease is a contract. You know what a contract is. A contract simply is when you have an offer and when you have an acceptance and when that is specifically offer plus acceptance is there so it becomes an agreement and when this agreement is legally enforceable so it becomes a contract so generally what's a contract simply uh, you ask me that how much are you gonna charge me for renting out this premises I tell you I'm gonna charge you let's say three thousand dollars $2,000. You say, okay, I'm going to pay you $1,500. I accept your offer. Now, so $1,500 is basically what, uh, what we have agreed to and uh, we have agreed to. So this is actually making of a contract between us where $1,500 is the consideration that we have agreed to. So when we talk about the IFRS 16, what is a lease agreement? What is a lease? A lease is a contract or it's a part of a contract. It may actually be the case that you've got the whole agreement which could, which could include multiple, multiple aspects. There could be multiple components of a contract and amongst those multiple components, some component, some component could be lease, some component may not be lease. Like for example, you um, take a house on lease and uh, you agree to a rental of let's say $2,000 and generally the building in which that house is situated, the flat is situated, that building has a normal uh, maintenance charges of monthly let's say $300. So this $2,000 contract is not the entire contract is going to be considered as lease. Part of the contract is lease, part of the contract is other agreement, other contract, it's not a lease contract. So a lease could be the whole contract a lease could be the part of the contract that conveys the right to use an asset that conveys the right to use an asset so basically what happens under a lease agreement is that if I own a building and if I'm giving you that building so I'm actually conveying you the right to use that asset I'm actually conveying you the right to use that asset which is also called the underlying asset which is also called underlying asset for a period of time in exchange for consideration You've got your relatives coming from a far location and they're going to stay back at your premises for three days, for five days, for even for 15 days. Now, if those relatives are going to stay back at your premises, you don't, you don't actually charge them anything. You don't actually charge them anything. 
they are using your rooms, they are using your house, maybe you are giving them uh, some two rooms, three rooms or maybe you have given them a whole apartment to use, they are not paying you anything. You have conveyed them the right to use the asset but that is not in exchange for a consideration. So it is not a lease agreement. So under the lease agreement there has to be an exchange of consideration. So basically it is a contract or it is part of a contract in which one party conveys the right to use of the asset to another party in exchange for consideration. So such an agreement is going to be considered as a lease agreement. And we have already discussed few examples about it. Now if I move a bit forward and if I discuss, so as we know we are studying IFRS 16 and IFRS 16 covers of the accounting for leases. So there are a few aspects of IFRS 16 that you would have to keep in mind which I think uh, for every single accounting standard that we would study, it is important that you should keep these things in mind which is the concept of a scope. When we talk about the word scope, the word scope actually means applicability. I repeat the word scope actually means applicability. I repeat the word scope actually means applicability. So is IFRS 16 applicable on all the lease agreements? That is a question mark. Now what is the question mark? The question mark is, is IFRS 16 applicable on all the lease agreements? The answer is no. IFRS 16 is applicable on all lease agreement with certain exceptions. Now what are those exceptions? So what are we going to do? We are going to talk about those exceptions now. We are going to discuss them that what are they and how are they going to be uh, accounted for. So if there is basically it is applicable on all lease agreements except for, except for what? Leases to explore for or use minerals, oils and similar resources. So like for example if you have got uh, oil exploration, you have got a contract for oil exploration you have got the right to use the land for oil exploration, gas exploration or some other mineral exploration. That contract is going to be covered up under IFRS 6 which is basically exploration of mineral resources. IFRS 17 leases, IFRS 16 leases does not apply to it. So that is actually covered up under IFRS 6 uh, uh, this um, uh, minerals and etc. Now, Leases of biological assets, you know biological assets what are they? They are living plants, living animals. So they are covered under IS 41. Like for example, if you lease out your uh, buffaloes to somebody for 6 months, so that is a leasing agreement because you are allowing them a right to use the buffaloes for 6 months and they are paying you consideration. So the contract to exchange buffaloes would not fall under IFRS 16, it would be accounted for under IS 41 agriculture. Then there are these service concession agreements etc, intellectual property licenses and uh, the licensing agreements within the scope of 38. Now let me just guide you a bit. Basically what happens is that if there is an intangible which you have actually given to somebody for a certain number of years, 4 years, 5 years, let us say you have allowed to somebody to use your patents for 5 years. So the revenue that is actually going to arise is going to be accounted for under IFRS 15 and plus that intangible would continue to be accounted for under IS 38. IS 38 gives accounting for it. So you won't apply uh, those uh, licensing agreements. The licensing agreements would not be dealt under IFRS 16. The licensing agreements would be dealt under IS 38. So always remember whenever you study any accounting standard, a very important area is to know about the scope. What is the scope? Is the applicability. Is this applicable on all the lease agreements? The answer is yes with few exceptions. What are few exceptions? The notable exceptions are four which is when you have got the lease of biological assets which fall under IS 41. When you have got lease agreements with respect to exploration of minerals, resources etc. So IFRS 16 does not apply. Then you have got uh, the licensing arrangements where you get uh, revenues for the licenses because you enter into a contract where you allow somebody to use your intellectual property for 4 year, 5 year etc. So when you enter into such type of licensing arrangement, so what is actually going to happen is it has to be accounted for under IFRS 50. Plus lastly 
uh, the asset which is subject to license is going to be accounted for under IS 38. Okay. Uh, there is a question which is what about the lease of a footballer now um, what do you lease you lease the whole footballer or you lease the uh, intellectual property you lease the right to have that footballer because the first thing that needs to be understood is that when we have footballer on board when we have a contract with a footballer on board so does that contract allows us to recognize an asset or not? That's a question mark. So for the timing, I can give you a short answer. I would get into details when I'll go for IS 38. I can give you a short answer that it is not going to fall under IFRS 16 because it's not actually a lease agreement. It's not actually a lease agreement. The footballer is not under your control. You give footballer to somebody, it's not necessary that the footballer would keep on performing. It's not necessary the footballer would uh, perform well or etc. So it's like the footballer is not under your control. It's some type of a financial asset because it's a contractual right to receive as. So he's not going to fall under this. But again, when I'll move on to IS 38, I'll consider this area. So basically, we were talking about the lease and I've actually talked about a bit of a basic introduction that what exactly is a lease agreement. So if any one of you have got any questions still here, just let me know or else I'm now going to move forward and I'll take up the accounting for lessee, uh, for, uh, accounting in the books of lessee. Okay guys, so we are going to now start discussing about the accounting by lessee. So how exactly are we going to account for in the books of the lessee? That is something that you need to understand. Basically, what happens is that whenever you enter into a lease agreement, whenever you enter into a lease agreement, so in accordance with IFRS 16, you as a lessee recognize two things. I repeat, as a lessee, you recognize two things. What are the two things that you recognize? One of them is you recognize the right of use of asset that's the first thing that you recognize and the second thing that you recognize is basically a lease liability so as a lessee what do you do you recognize the right of use of the asset and you recognize a lease liability now at what value am i going to recognize the right of use of the asset so the right of use of the asset is going to be recognized at cost and the lease liability is going to be recognized at present value. Now let me just give you a bit of an idea that when we talk about the right of use of the asset to be recognized at cost and the lease liability at present value, what exactly is this present value going to be? What exactly is this cost going to be? So before I move on to it, I will just take you people to IAS 16, the property plant equipment. I want you people to have a quick recall of the property plant equipment first because when we are going to do the recalling of property plant equipment that's going to make uh, things more easier for you. If you could recall from IS 16 property plant equipment so what we do is that we recognize the property plant and equipment initially at its cost and cost of the property plant equipment actually includes three things. What are those three things? Those three things our purchase price the directly attributable cost and the third one of them is called dismantling cost so I repeat when we talk about the property plant equipment what do we do we actually have got three issues. One of them is purchase price. Second is directly attributable cost. The third is dismantling cost. And when we talk about the purchase price, I repeat, when we talk about the purchase price, the purchase price concept is like this. The purchase price includes everything, the list price, the less the trade discount, less the rebates, add import duty, add taxes, etc, etc. There are so many things to the purchase price. So let's say if it is 400,000 the purchase price, 
So let's let's just take this number. And then there is this directly attributable cost. What are those directly attributable costs? So generally all those costs which are incurred in order to bring the asset into the condition and location as intended by management. Now it would include everything. It would include the transport cost. It would include the handling cost. It would include the installation cost. It would include other testing costs, etc., etc. So all of them are actually part and parcel of the costs that are to be incurred in order to bring the asset into the condition and the location as intended by management. So let's just take an example that it's 250,000. That is the cost that's, that's the directly attributable cost. So let's say if you have a purchase price of 400,000, you have a directly attributable cost of 250,000. That's what you have. Now the dismantling cost. We always calculate the dismantling cost at present value. Now what's the present value of dismantling cost? So like for example, if the life of asset is five years, four years, three years, you're gonna remove this asset from its position after four years. You're gonna remove this asset after five years from its position. So all the expected cost that you would incur for removing this cost from, for this removing this asset from its position, plus any site cleanup cost, because at times what happens is that, uh, let's say if you have a rented premises and you have set up some machinery over there, so obviously the use of machinery would uh, would would have a damage would cause a damage to the uh, floor and etc. So when you are going to remove it, when you are going to vacate the premises, you might actually have to repair the whole of it. So what we do is that we make an estimate of the total cost. Let's say if it was hundred thousand, we estimate the present value and we add it add it up to the cost of the asset. So basically what happens is that when we talk about the concept of, I repeat. When we talk about the concept of the cost of the property plant equipment. So cost of the property plant equipment include these three things. Purchase price, directly attributable cost and dismantling cost. So let's say if it is 400, 250 plus 100. So 750,000 is going to be considered as the cost of the property plant and equipment. Now, just think about just think about entering into a lease agreement. Just think about you are purchasing a machine, you are obtaining a machine which has a total life of four years and you are leasing out that machine for four years. So technically you are buying that machine. Technically you are buying that machine. The machine was actually uh, had a life of four years. That means this machine is going to last for four years and you are leasing it for four years. That means you are going to use it for four years. So technically you are going to be using this machine for the whole of its life. So what I can say is that this machine belongs to you. Now, IFRS 16, what it does is that it gives a guidance like this. It says that as a lessee, what you should do is that you should recognize the right of use of the asset. Because when you are obtaining an asset under lease, you are actually obtaining a right to use the asset. And in addition to this, you recognize a lease liability. What do you do? You recognize a lease liability in addition to this. So you've got a right of use of the asset and you've got a lease liability. So it's just like, it's just like, uh, as we recognize property plant equipment at cost, so similarly we recognize right of use of the asset under the lease. And again, this right of use of the asset is actually at the cost. And what is the cost of this right of use of the asset? The cost of this right of use of the asset is like this, see. The cost of the right of use of the asset includes these five elements. What are these five elements? It includes lease liability. I'm going to talk about it. But for the time being related to IS 16 PPE, where we talked about the purchase price. So it's a lease liability plus initial direct cost plus 
cost of removal and site restoration plus payments made at or prior to commencement less this is less I have written them in the brackets it's less less the lease incentives received now I'm gonna guide you one by one each one of these things what is lease liability forget about it right now just think that lease liability is present value of payments made over lease term so it's the uh, present value of the payments made over the lease term plus initial direct cost so when you enter into a lease you have to incur certain costs what are those certain costs like bringing the asset to your location installing the asset testing the asset etc etc so they are also included and they are also they also become part and parcel of the cost of the right of use of the asset plus the cost of removal and site restoration just like we talked about the dismantling cost so again this is recorded at present value then payments made at or prior to commencement of the lease like for example I tell you that look if you want to enter into this lease agreement so I need to kick out my existing tenant you pay me 500,000 upfront before I mean like that's in addition to the lease payments pay me 500,000 upfront so that I can kick out this person and give the asset to you so maybe if you make any payments upfront at advance in addition so they're all going to be included in the right of use of the assets cost unless any lease incentives received at times I'll just give you an idea when new malls new shopping malls are uh, constructed so these um, um, the mall owners the companies who own the mall they want big brands to come and set up shops over there so that when you've got a big brand in a shopping mall automatically it attracts audience let's say for example if you have got big brands like H&M is there, Next is there, Marks and Spencers are there, then Debenhams is there or whatsoever other brand. Uh, so what happens is that when you've got big brands, automatically people get attracted towards that shopping mall. And when people get attracted towards shopping mall, so those shopping mall owners, they now get an opportunity to then charge uh, exorbitant rents for the subsequent uh, rentals that they invite people to take the shops for so the shops or the cabins or whatsoever then they charge the subsequent uh, good rentals they might even give some uh, uh, they might encourage let's say Starbucks Costa Coffee Tim Hortons to come and set up coffee shops so that people could come and sit in the mall for two hours three hours etc so generally speaking let's say if you are a Tim if you are a Tim Hortons owner and you're being asked that come and set up a shop at this uh, mall you would say I'm not interested because we think it's a new mall we don't want to etc do this thing so maybe the mall owners might tell you that okay you come have some five six months rent free period plus whatever your initial setup cost we're gonna give that as a incentive to you that okay whatever cost that is on us so maybe you are incurring let's say one million dollar for setting up a shop the mall owners might actually be paying it so that's the lease incentive that you have received and obviously that has to be deducted because ultimately you are not paying it you have got an incentive received so first of all when you have when you enter into a lease so as a lessee you recognize an asset what is the name of that asset the name of the asset is right of use of the asset it's ROU it's commonly known as ROU so what do you do you recognize an asset and the name of this asset is ROU the right of use of the asset so what do you do you recognize right of use of the asset at what value at its cost what is the cost of right of use of the asset the cost of the right of use of the asset includes lease liability the cost of the right of use of the asset includes the initial direct cost the cost of restoration site removal which we also call dismantling cost 
plus any costs that are being paid prior to or entering into lease less less <coughs> any lease incentives that you have received so that's what it is actually going to so like maybe uh, whatever the lease liabilities are we're going to talk about it let's say the cost of the right of use of the asset is 4 million so you're going to recognize the right of use of the asset at 4 million just think about it's just like recognizing a property plant equipment but since you have not purchased it outright you purchase it through a lease agreement so you are not recognizing PPE you are instead recognizing a right of use of the asset I repeat since you have not purchased it outright and you have taken it under a lease so the identification in the financial statements is the right of use of the asset that's it so what have we discussed we have discussed the concept of the cost of the right of use of the asset and the cost of the right of the use of the asset includes five components and amongst them the lease incentives are to be deducted because that's the that's the negative cost you don't pay it you actually get it refunded let's move a bit forward let's discuss further now how do we calculate the lease liability again just wait a bit I'm gonna take you people through the calculations so if I talk about the lease liability the lease liability is basically in simple terms it is the amount that you would pay during the term of the lease it's the amount that you would pay during the term of the entire lease the only difference being that this has to be discounted to present value because obviously you are making one payment after one year after two year after three year after four year so ultimately you would have to discount it so when I talk about the lease liability first of all remember the lease liability is calculated at present value what do we mean by present value that means you got to discount it that means you got to discount all the inflows all the pay, all the outflows that you have to make so you have to calculate the present value of the amounts mentioned below at at what rate at interest rate implicit in the lease now what do we mean by this interest rate implicit in the lease actually means lessors I repeat, interest rate implicit in the lease actually means lessor's desired rate. I repeat, interest rate implicit in the lease actually means lessor's desired rate. Let me take you through. When we talk about the concept of lessor's desired rate, I'm a lesser, I own an asset. I want to give that asset to you on lease obviously I've got a target return I've got a return of 12 percent I've got a return of 15 percent 5 percent 4 percent I've got a target return now if I have got a target return so I would recover that return from you I would recover that return. I would incorporate that target return in the lease rentals so basically the lease liabilities means whatever payments that you have to make to the lesser so what is it that you need to do you need to record them at present value and in order to calculate present value what is it that you need to use you need to use the lessers interest rate implicit in the lease which is the lessers desired return now IFRS 16 says that in case if this lessers desired rate is not known if you are not able to ascertain it, if you are not able to establish it, then what you need to do is that you need to use lessee's incremental borrowing rate. Now what do you mean by this? When we talk about using the lessee's incremental borrowing rate, let me just give you a bit of a guidance. Basically what happens is that you are a lessee, you go to bank, let's say the asset had a market value of $2 million. I mean, let's say the asset had a market value of $2 million. 
Now what happens is you go to the bank and you tell the bank I need $2 million loan. So the bank would obviously be charging some interest. So whatever rate, whatever rate that the bank is going to charge you for obtaining the loan for this house is going to be termed as your incremental borrowing rate. So like for example, let's say the lesser was desiring a 14% rate. But you, when you go to the bank and you ask them for money, they are giving you money for 16%. Now, I need to help you understand this. Basically, <clears throat> let me just repeat what's actually happening. Try to understand. What's actually happening is that you are a lessee. You want an asset. The lesser is the lesser is giving you asset. The lesser is desiring a return of 14%. So you will pay him rentals incorporating that 14% return that he wants. But let's say if you don't find anyone to give you an asset, so what will you do? You will borrow the money from bank and you will buy the asset. So now the rate at which bank will give you money to buy this type of asset that's called your incremental borrowing rate. So IFRS 16 says whatever the payments that you have to make, what are those payments that you have to make? These payments that you have to make. So whatever the payments that you have to make, so you have to discount them using interest rate implicit in the lease and if that rate is not available then you have to discount using the lessee's incremental borrowing rate. What do you need to do? You need to use lessee's incremental borrowing rate. You get my point? Incremental borrowing rate. Now, let's move a bit forward and let's see that what is included in the lease payments. So there are four things which are included in the lease payments. One of them is fixed payment. The other one of them is called variable lease payments. Third is the residual value guarantees. Fourth is the price of bargain purchase option. Fifth is the penalties for the termination of the lease. Now let me just let me just guide you each one of them one by one that what exactly are they. You obtained an asset under lease. The lesser says, I need $100,000 per annum fixed. I need $100,000 per annum fixed. What is it called? It's called fixed payment. That's it. So the lease liability would include fixed payments. The fixed payments minus the lease incentives that you have received. What do you mean by minus the lease incentive? Let me just guide you. I just gave you a guidance about the lease incentives. Let maybe in order to set up initially, maybe you are being given uh, $500,000 and this lease agreement is for 15 years. So this is like 1.5 million less you have already received 0.5 million lease, receive, lease incentives. So net 1 million is going to be the fixed payment. So that's number one. Number two is variable lease payment. Now what exactly do you mean by variable lease payment? Let me just give you a bit of an idea. Let's say you are being told that current consumer price index is X. Let's say if this consumer price index moves to Y, then what happens is that you would have to pay 20% of your $100,000 rental. Right now you're paying $100,000. The inflation measure is at this level. But in case if the inflation goes up, then you'll have to pay this extra amount. Now let me just guide you a bit. Basically what's going to happen? The payments, the extra payments that you will make, they are not fixed, they are not mandatory, they are not every year. They are occasional, they are sometimes, they are at times when there is some change. So such payments are going to be considered as variable payments. 
I bet such payments are gonna be considered as variable payments. <coughs> so coming back to it, the lease liability would be present value of fixed payments plus variable lease payments. The third one is basically the amounts expected to be payable by the lessee under residual value guarantees. Now, what is this residual value guarantee? Let me just give you a bit of an idea that what this residual value guarantee is all about. The residual value guarantee or which is also commonly known as the residual value guarantee which is also commonly known as guaranteed residual value. What exactly is it? Let me just guide you. Basically, assume that you go to a bank or you go to some leasing company and you tell them that we want to buy this car. They tell you that this car is worth $100,000 and uh, when we are gonna finance this car, we need a return of let's say 20%. So we need $20,000 on top of it. So that means we want $120,000 in total. How many years are you gonna take? Okay, just being uh, very clear, I'm just making things simple for you to be able to understand. So you say that uh, all that I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna take five years. So they tell you that means you got to pay $24,000 a year. That's what your rental is. You tell them this is too high. I cannot afford this. And you insist upon making this rental $15,000. The leasing company says that, hello, we are there to earn. We're not even going to be able to cover our cost in this 15,000 because 15,000 into 5 is $75,000. This asset, we bought it for 100,000. And we're giving it to you for use. And you say that you're gonna pay 15,000 a year? Are you joking? No. So what's actually gonna happen? Let's try to understand. You tell this leasing institution, you say that, look, after five years, I'm going to return this asset to you and I believe that I can guarantee you a residual value of $50,000 for this asset, let's say. Or I can guarantee you $45,000 as a residual value for this asset. Now what does the bank say? Bank says explain, it, explain this further to us. So you tell the bank that look, your target was $120,000. I'm going to make you payments of $75,000. That means $45,000 is the balance. Now, if this $45,000 is the balance, so we are gonna return this asset back to you. We are gonna return this asset back to you. And when we are gonna return this asset back to you, you can sell it in the market and you can get 45,000 or you can lease it out to somebody. The bank would say, hello, what if, what if after five years, this asset is not being sold for 45, then what are we gonna do? So you tell the bank that, look, hello, we are giving you a guarantee. We're giving you a guarantee. If you are not able to fetch $45,000 for it, talk to us, we will compensate you. We'll give you the balance amount, we'll compensate you. So now, if you are actually gonna compensate them, just try to understand them. What are you gonna do? You're gonna say, okay. This is our guarantee. So let's say if the residual value, actual residual value is 40,000, take 5,000 from us. 
if the actual residual value is 30,000, take 15,000 from us. You don't have to worry. We are giving you a guarantee of 45,000. You will get 45,000 as a residual value plus we are giving you 15,000 each year. So that makes it 120,000 your target money. Bank says okay. If you are giving us a guarantee that no matter what happens, we will be compensated for this 45,000 residual value. We are, we, are, we are agreeable to enter into a contract. So guaranteed residual value, what exactly is the concept of it? Guaranteed residual value is basically that portion of residual value which is guaranteed by by a lessee or a party connected to lessee. So what is the resi guaranteed residual value? It's that portion of residual value which is guaranteed by a lessee or a party connected to lessee. So when you enter into a contract you say okay this is the amount that I am giving a guarantee for. No matter what happens I have to pay this amount. So as a lessee you know the fixed payments are separate item, the variable payments are another item and the third one of them is the guarantees are another item. Then number four it says the exercise price of purchase options if the lessee is reasonably certain to exercise that option. The exercise price of a purchase option if the lessee is reasonably certain to exercise that option. Now let me just guide you a bit. Assume that you buy an asset sorry you uh, there is an asset which has a market value right now of 20,000 and after five years you expect the market value of the asset to be 4,000. You enter into a lease contract with a bank and the bank tells you that hey, you can buy this asset for $200 after five years. We are giving we are going to give you a choice that you can buy this asset for $200 at the end of five years. I repeat the asset had a cost of 20,000 you could not afford 20,000 so you entered into a lease agreement and it's a five year lease agreement and at the end of year five you are expecting the residual value to be $4,000 but the bank or the leasing institution is giving you an option that you can buy this asset for $200. Now, so this option that the bank has actually given you is one of those options that it is reasonably certain, it is highly certain, it is highly probable that you are going to exercise no matter what happens. You are for sure going to exercise this option at the end of year 5. Because you know even if you don't want to keep this asset you can still exercise the option, you can buy it for $200 and you could sell it in the market for 4000 so in accordance with IFRS 16, such type of options are commonly known as bargain purchase options. What are they called? They are called bargain purchase options. What are they termed as? They are termed as bargain purchase options. So what's a bargain purchase option? Bargain purchase options is one of those options which, is, which it is highly likely, which is it is virtually certain it's going to be exercised. So if there is any value attached to the bargain purchase option that is also included in the lease liability. The last portion, the last co component of this lease liability is the penalties for terminating of the lease. Is the penalties for the termination of the lease if less lease term reflects lessee exercising an option to terminate the lease. Like for example, uh, you want a premises for, for, for three years. You want a premises for three years and the lesser actually knows that um, the premises that he has is the only premises that is available in the area 
and no matter what happens, if he insists on five year, you will actually lease it for five year. So the lesser says, I'm not going to lease out for any period less than five year. And if you terminate the lease before five year, so whatever the balance lease term is, you will pay that balance term multiply by 30% to me as a penalty. Or let's say you're going to pay 25% of the balance term as a penalty to me. Now what does that mean? That would mean you need the premises for 3 years. The lesser is insisting 5 years. Without 5 years, I'm not going to give you this asset on lease. And you don't need premises after 3 years. You only have got a project or a contract for 3 years for which we need this land. But the problem is there is no other piece of land available in the area which you can take on lease and this is the only piece of land that is available. So what are you going to do? You're going to take, you're going to agree to this five year lease term. And you would know from day one that at the end of the year three we will terminate the lease and we'll pay the penalty. So that means if two year is the balance period because at the end of year three we will terminate the lease. The agreement was five year. Five minus three, two year is remaining. So of the two year, 25% is what you have to pay. Of the two year, 25% is what you have to pay. That means half year, that means six months. So from day one, from day one you would have this in mind that even though we want this premises for three year but because of the circumstances we have to take it on five year and no matter what happens we will terminate the lease at the end of the year three so that means we'll pay extra six months rentals as a penalty so from day one you know that it's three and a half year payments that you will be making so what you would do is that you would use you would incorporate that six months penalty payment into your lease liability calculation when you would be recognizing the lease liability initially you get my point. So your lease liability would include five things. The fixed payments, the variable payments, the guaranteed portions of residual value. If there is any bargain purchase option, so bargain purchase option. And lastly, the fifth one is going to be the penalties. If it is highly likely that those penalties are going to be incurred. So what is it that you got to do? You got to do, uh, you got to actually uh, discount uh, all of them using the interest rate implicit in the lease and if this interest rate implicit in the lease is not available I repeat if this interest rate implicit in the lease is not available then you would use lessee's incremental borrowing rate okay I've got a question from somebody uh, is it probable to have both residual value guarantees and purchase option in one contract highly unlikely either of them either of them it's either going to be residual value, guaranteed residual value or it's going to be bargain purchase option because just think about it. What does guaranteed residual value means? I don't need the asset at the end of lease term, I'm going to return it back. What does bargain purchase option means? I'm going to buy the asset, I'll transfer the ownership to myself. So both of them cannot coexist. Okay, so as a lessee, you are going to recognize the right of use of the asset at cost and you're going to recognize the lease liability at present value. <coughs> there is some further discussion that we have to do with respect to the lease. I'm just going to come back to it. Um, initial direct costs is explained over here that what are these initial direct costs their incremental costs of obtaining a lease that would not have been incurred if the lease if the lease had not been obtained these might include finder fee like the commission broker fee agent fee etc etc then there is this lease incentives explained also what i am going to do is that before i move forward i'm just going to discuss um, one of the examples and uh, after discussing that example initially I will then move forward so 
So there's this one example and it's a very simple example, it's a very basic example and the whole objective it okay uh, yeah sir don't worry about it the recording is being done on a separate uh, medium don't worry about it okay there is this Vivek City if at the third year project gets extended is the liability recalculated for two yes uh, the liability is going to be recalculated because that's a reassessment of the lease term, the lease term is being uh, reassessed. So yes, it's going to be done. Uh, we're going to come come to that specific area later on, not right now. Okay, that's a simple example in front of you. It says present value of lease payment is hundred thousand. The dismantling costs are fourteen thousand five hundred. The directly attributable costs are ten thousand five hundred, and it says required is accounting entry to record initial recognition. If I talk about the sum of all of this, it's actually going to be 125,000. What is it? It's going to be 125,000. Now let's discuss. Basically what happens is that you are simply going to recognize like this, right? of use of the asset debit by 125,000 lease liability is gonna be credited by 100,000 dismantling liability or provision I would rather use the word provision dismantling provision is gonna be credited by 14,500 and then in addition to this there is going to be a cash which is credited by 10,500 so hence resultingly what is gonna happen This is a basic example where I have not done any calculations. I have just tried to explain to people that look, you enter into a lease agreement, you establish the lease liability, you establish whatever dismantling costs, etc. etc. So basic concept is first of all to establish the cost of right of use of the asset. Once you have established the cost of right of the use of the asset, you say R O U debit. And then you say credit, credit is lease liability. Then you say credit dismantling provision because we will incur this cost later on and then you credit the cash which you have paid for the initial direct cost etc. So that's what is deducted out of it. I'll move a bit forward and I'll uh, discuss one of the examples uh, which is actually practice question one. This is an example where the rentals are being paid in arrears. I'm going to discuss this example with you people. I can solve it on the spreadsheet also and I can solve it manually also. I'm going to do both. Uh, basically one of the questions I'll do, uh, in fact I'll do both in this specific example so that you could have an idea. So the first thing is that it says the lease term is four years. The annual rentals which are paid in arrears, the arrears means at the end of the year. That means that's time period one, time period two, time period three, time period four. So you've got rentals which are paid in arrears one, two, three, four. Then there is this guaranteed residual value, 100,000. The discount rate is 10%. It says accounting entries for the initial recognition. Now, you know, with respect to initial recognition, first of all, you need to calculate the present value of lease liability. How 
how would you calculate the lease liability you would say here you would say cash flow you would say discount factor and you would say present value basically it's a four year lease term and the rentals are paid in arrears so it's time period 1 2 3 and 4 the annual cash flow is $150,000 At time period 4, it is $100,000. Now, let me just guide you people a bit. Let me just take you people through. 10% is the discount rate. And if I could just quickly recall the discount factors with you people. So, whenever we have got constant cash flows, what do we use? We use... annual defect whenever we have got variable cash flows variable cash flow means like one off cash flow or 2000 in one year 5000 in another year 3000 in another year so that's variable cash flows so whenever we use variable cash flows the variable cash flows what do we use we use the present value factor so i repeat one of them is called a discount factor, one of them is called a present value uh, annuity factor and the other one of them is called a present value factor. What's the formula for annuity factor? It's 1 minus one minus 1 plus r power minus n divided by r. And for the present value factor, the formula is 1 plus r power minus n. So when we talk about this, say, 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 say. When we talk about this, what are we going to do? We are going to say this is 1 minus 1.1 power minus 4 divided by 0.1. And this is going to be 1.1 power minus 4. From the examination perspective, you are usually given these uh, present value factors. So you don't have to worry about, but just that you need to keep in mind that when you have got constant cash flow, you apply annuity. When you have got variable cash flow, you apply present value factor. So this is actually going to be 475 480 and this is going to be 68301 And this is going to be 543.781. So what are you going to get? You are going to get the present value which is actually 543.781. So with respect to the initial recognition your accounting entry is going to be right of use of the asset debit 543781 and correspondingly lease liability created by 543781 
543-781 is the right of use of the asset debit and the lease liability created by 543-781. Please review this and let me know if any one of you have got any questions till now. Yeah, please review this and let me know if you, any one of you have got any questions till now. Yeah, hello, is everyone okay? Okay, lovely. So basically, what have we discussed till now? We have discussed the accounting from the in, from the perspective of lessee and what is it that we have discussed we have discussed that a lessee initially recognizes a right of use of the asset and a lease liability at what value are you going to recognize the right of use of the asset so the right of use of the asset is going to be recognized at cost and what is the cost of right of use of the asset it's the lease liability plus the initial direct cost, plus uh, any directly attributable cost, less any lease incentives, etc, etc. And what is the lease liability? The lease liability is the present value of the cash flows discounted using interest rate implicit in the lease. If interest rate implicit in the lease is not available, we use lessee's incremental borrowing rate. What are the cash flows that we have to discount? So the cash flows that we have to discount include what? Number one, fixed payments. Number two, any variable payments. Any guaranteed residual value. Any bargain purchase options. And the last one is them. And the last one of them is any, uh, termi any termination penalties if it is highly likely that you are going to be incurring those termination penalties. Okay, let's move a bit forward. So we have talked about the initial recognition. Now what is it that we need to do? We need to talk about the subsequent measurement. We need to talk about subsequent measurement. So basically when you have recognized the lease, you have recognized two components. One of them is right of use of the asset. The other one of them is a lease liability. What have you done? You have recognized two components right of use of the asset plus the lease liability. Now how exactly are you going to do it? Let's try to understand this. So basically with respect to the right of use of the asset, IFRS 16 says that as an entity, what is it that you need to do? You need to recognize this right of use of the asset either using cost model or either using revaluation model or using the fair value model if it is classified as investment property. Let me just guide you a bit. Let's say you obtained a house under a lease. Let's say you obtained a house uh, under a lease. Now, obviously you're, gonna, you're not going to recognize property plant equipment. You would rather recognize what? You would recognize right of use of the asset. How exactly do you recognize, how, how exactly would you carry that right of use of the asset? So it's a choice that you have as an entity. You can use the cost model as defined under IS 16. You can use the revaluation model again as defined under IS 16. 
or you could use fair value model as defined under IAS 40 investment property. Now let me just give you guidance on each one of them that what exactly are they going to be. Number one, when we talk about the cost model, the cost of the property plant equipment is established as what? The cost of the property plant equipment is, uh, sorry, the net book value of the property plant equipment is established as cost less accumulated depreciation less accumulated impairment. So I repeat, how do you establish the cost of property plant equipment? Uh, sorry, the carrying amount of property plant equipment under cost uh, model, it's cost minus the accumulated depreciation minus the accumulated impairment. The same approach is going to be used with respect to right of use of the asset. You simply say cost less accumulated depreciation less accumulated impairment. When we talk about the revaluation model, how are we going to apply the revaluation model? That's something that needs to be understood. So when you are going to be applying the revaluation model, the revaluation model is simply fair value less subsequent accumulated depreciation less subsequent accumulated impairment. So it's simply going to be fair value less subsequent accumulated depreciation less subsequent accumulated impairment. And again, whatever the revaluation that you do, it has to be followed, it has to be done under IS 16. Just like the frequency should be such that the carrying amount and the fair value does not have a significant difference. Similarly, any revaluation gain loss has to be taken to the other comprehensive income etc etc. Whatever that you study in IS 16, the same things need to be studied here also. The next thing is, if I talk about the fair value model, so you can understand one thing that what is an investment property. So when you have got a land or you've got a building and you have held that land or building for either renting out to others or for capital appreciation, I repeat when you've got a land or if you've got a building and you've held that land or building either for renting out to others or for capital appreciation purposes. So in that case, what actually happens is that that is considered to be investment property. So under investment property, at times you carry that at fair value model. So what happens under fair value model? No depreciation, no depreciation. It says that you record at fair value and any gains or losses are taken to penal. You recorded fair value, any gains or losses are taken to fair value. That's what you do. So anyways, coming back to it. So when you have got the right of use of the asset, what is it that you're going to do? You're going to recognize it either using cost model or the revaluation model or using the fair value model if it is an investment property. Now, a very important aspect of all of this is that how to calculate depreciation? How to depreciate this right of use of the asset? So I repeat, very important aspect is that how to depreciate this right of use of the asset? So basically, in order to depreciate the right of use of the asset, what is it that you need to do? You need to establish that uh, what should be the length of the time over which this asset or right of use should be depreciated. So in accordance with IFRS 16, IFRS 16 says, that look, you need to ask yourself a question. What is that question? That as a lessee, I have taken this asset under the lease. Arbit. So first of all, you got to ask yourself a question as a lessee that the asset that I have taken under the lease, will the title be transferred to me or will it not be transferred? Like maybe you use the asset for three years, you return it back so the title doesn't transfer. 
मे बी यूज द एसेट फॉर थ्री ईयर्स एंड अल्टीमेटली यू ट्रांसफर द टाइटल यू ने यू ब्रिंग इट इन योर ओन नेम सो यू वुड हैव टू सी एज अ लेसी वॉट इज एक्चुअली गोइंग टू हैपन सो लेट से If the title is expected to be transferred, yes. Let's say if yes, then you have to depreciate it over useful life. But if the title is not expected to transfer, then you have to depreciate over shorter of useful life or lease term. So let's say if the useful life is four years and lease term is three year, so you would depreciate over three year. So what are we gonna do with respect to right of use of the asset? The right of use of the asset has to be depreciated. How is it depreciated? The depreciation would depend upon will the title transfer to you or will the title not transfer to you. So if the title is going to transfer to you, you would depreciate using uh, the useful life. If the title is not going to be transferred to you, you will depreciate over the shorter of useful life or lease term. now so one of the aspect of accounting was that you have to you have to actually what depreciate the right of use of the asset what about the lease liability so when i talk about the concept of lease liability so what is it that you are going to do with respect to lease liability so when as an entity we make payment of rentals i repeat when as an entity we make whether lessee we make payment of rentals the rentals have got two components what are those two components the lease rentals that we have got one of them is basically the interest expense which we also call the finance cost obviously the lesser he needs a return so the installments that you pay it includes two elements one of them is principal amount and the other one of them is the interest amount now so what actually happens is that the lease payments have to be a portion between finance cost and repayment of lease liability so you took the asset under lease simply it's actually taking a loan so the loan has got two elements interest and principal similarly this lease liability would also have got two elements interest and principal so you would split it now how would you split it you would split it using effective interest method what exactly is this method how do we apply it so what i'll do is that the example that i discussed a while ago with you people i repeat the example that i discussed with you people a while ago i'm just gonna i'm just gonna continue with that same example so that we could have more discussion on this now see what was the example the example was you obtained an asset under a lease for a period of 4 year the rentals were payable in arrears the annual rental was 150000 the guaranteed residual value was 100000 so on and so forth ultimately you established the lease liability and it turned out to be 543781 You establish the lease liability. It turned out to be five forty three seven eighty one. You simply said right of use of the asset debit lease liability created by five forty three seven eighty one. Now, the lease term is four years. The useful life of the asset is not given, but the guaranteed residual value is given. When the guaranteed residual value is given, okay the question is silent cost model or revaluation model we'll use cost model when the guaranteed residual value is given that means asset would be returned that means title won't transfer so if the title won't transfer so ultimately what are we going to do we are going to say that we have to depreciate over the shorter of useful life or lease term here useful life is not given so i'm just assuming lease term is the one that's going to be used so how would you depreciate it
the depreciation is calculated like this cost minus residual value divided by useful life or lease term now what is it going to be 543 781 minus there is a cost then there is this residual value which is going to be 100,000 cost and then there is this residual value then you divide it over the lease term it turns out to be 110945 this is the depreciation expense that will arise each year this is the depreciation expense that will arise each year now try to understand something so that means from year 1 till year 4 you will have this accounting entry which is depreciation expense debit 110945 and the accumulated depreciation is going to be credited by 110945 if I talk about all this So from the perspective of the company's financial statements from the perspective of the company's financial statements you will have what? You would say that cost minus accumulated depreciation cost cost minus accumulated depreciation gives you net book value so the cost is going to be Basically, what's going to happen? The residual value is 100,000 There is a slight rounding off issue that is arising That is just because I rounded off the depreciation expense That is why there is a slight rounding off issue But anyways So what are you going to do? So resultingly what is actually going to happen is that this is how it is going to be time period 1 till time period 4. So basically one of the aspect is that you have to account for the right of use of the asset. How exactly are you going to account for right of the use of the asset? This is how you are going to do it. That you simply what you do? 
you simply establish the cost and then what happens is that you have to depreciate it. Since over here the useful life was not given, we simply use the lease term. So the lease term was what? 4 years. So what, see, what we simply did was, we said okay, for a period of 4 years, this is how it is going to be. 1 till 4, this is what it is going to be. Now, next aspect is the lease. I mean, the next aspect is that how would we account for this lease liability. So basically what happens is that with respect to the lease liability, you would create a lease amortization schedule. I repeat, what are you going to do? You are going to create a lease amortization schedule. What are you going to do? You are going to create a lease amortization schedule. Okay. Now with respect to lease amortization schedule, there are different ways of creating it. Everyone has got a different way. Um, so the way I do it is that I say date I say rental finance cost please bear with me for my writing I know it's very bad um, Repayment of lease liability and then balance lease liability. So you've got what? You've got the lease amortization schedule which is date, rental, finance cost. Uh, the repayment of lease liability and the balance lease liability. Let's try to understand this. <clears throat> Basically, at time period 0, you would recognize the lease liability which was 543,781. Then you have got time period 1, you have got time period 2, you have got time period 3, you have got time period 4. The annual rentals that were supposed to be there were 150,000. I paid the annual rentals that were supposed to be there was 150,000. The discount rate was 10%. How exactly are we going to account for all this? Just try to understand. <coughs> First of all, you would say, um, First of all, you would say that what's the opening lease liability? So at the start of the year, there was 543,781 of the lease liability. Since this liability is going to stay outstanding for the whole of the year, because you know the rule of interest, the interest accrues over time. The interest accrues over time. So since this, since this liability is going to uh, stay there for the whole of the year, so there is going to be an interest accruing it for the whole of the year. So it's going to be 54,378. That's one thing. <coughs> 
now we knew that we had a liability of 543,781 and an interest of 54,378 accrued on it. If I am actually paying a rental of 150,000 and if 54,378 is the interest that's accruing, so 95,622 is the liability that I am repaying. So like of that 150,000, some amount is interest, some amount is liability repayment. What is the liability repayment? That's 95,622. The difference between this opening and the closing liability, sorry, the opening liability and the repayment amount would actually be your closing liability. Similarly, for the next year, the liability is 448,159. You multiply it with 10%. So it's going to be 44,816. If I deduct 150,000 out of it, it's going to be 105,184. So the liability at the end of year 2 is going to be 342,975. The liability at the end of year 2 is going to be 342,975. Then similarly, You will end up at 100,000 which is the guaranteed residual value. I am just doing the final year as a balancing figure. Why? Because I am not using a spreadsheet over here. So there is a rounding off issue that is going to arise actually. So 127, 273 and this is going to be 22,000. 727. 22,727. So basically what are you going to do? You are going to create a lease amortization schedule and this lease amortization schedule is being created using effective interest method. What happens under effective interest method is in front of you right now. Now, how exactly are we going to do the accounting for this? So let me just guide you. Basically, um, I don't have much space on this page. So I'm just going to do one of the accounting journals for you so that you could see that what is going to be there. So what are we going to do? We're going to say, Finance cost, debit. Lease liability, debit. And correspondingly, if I, let's say, if I pass an entry for year two, my entry for year 2 is going to be like this. The finance cost for year 2 is 44,816. 
the lease liability is 105 184 and the cash is going to be created by 150,000. That's how you're going to do. And you're going to continue passing the entries like this for each of the year. You will continue passing the entries like this for each of the year. And when it comes to presentation of this liability in the balance sheet, which is the SOFP. So you need to, what do you need to do? You need to make sure that this lease liability is split into you need to make sure that this lease liability is split into the current and the non-current portion. How exactly are you going to split this into current non-current portion? So I'm going to demonstrate this to you from the table that we just created. So time period 1, time period 2, time period 3, time period 4. Non-current liability. Current liability. So as I said that lease liability is to be split into the non-current and the current portion. Now you know what is current. The current means the amount that's payable within the next 12 months. The amount that's payable within next 12 months is current. Now try to understand. We've got this table in front of us. If I'm standing here, which is at the end of year one. So that means my total liability is 448, 159. My total liability is 448, 159. I need to see what's going to happen in the next 12 months. So in the next 12 months, I'm actually going to be repaying this. And this amount is going to be repaid after the next 12 months. Because current portion is what's repayable within next 12 months. Non-current is after the 12 months. So I can just give you something to remember that if you have got a lease liability which is in arrears, in arrears, all that you have to do is that create a schedule and the amount which is coming into the next year's repayment that's a current liability. So 105184 is the current liability. And this 342 is the non-current liability. So your total liability comes out to be 448, 159. Now let's come back to the next one. Again you are here. And the next 12 months, 115703 is to be repaid. So what's the amount which is repayable after 12 months? It's 227273. Hence, resultingly, it's going to be 342,975. Now, if I talk about the next one, 127,273 is the amount to be repayable in the next 12 months. But at the end of the year 4, it is probably going to be 0 both. Now why? Because we are not going to just keep the guaranteed residual value. We are just going to get over it. We are just going to get over it. But 
I could create, I could create two scenarios. Before settlement, after settlement. So before settlement, it's going to be like this. After settlement, it's going to be zero. Like before settlement, you still have 100,000 to settle out with respect to the guaranteed result value. But once you have settled, you don't have any liability. OK, uh, see, with respect to interest, there is always a rule with respect to interest. It's always accrued once the time has passed. The interest is always accrued when the time has passed. If the time has not passed, interest is not accrued. You don't recognize the interest before that. You get my point? OK. So basically, when we are talking about the accounting in the books of Lessee, this is how we do it. We initially recognize the right of use of the asset and a lease liability. And subsequently, what do we do? We depreciate the right of use of the asset depending upon title transfers or not. If it transfers, we depreciate uh, over the useful life. If it does not transfer, we depreciate over the shorter of useful life or lease term. With respect to lease liability, you have to uh, apply the amortized effective interest method. And through effective interest method, the lease uh, rentals are split into finance costs and repayment of lease liability. And once they are split, you have got a closing liability. That liability has to be split between current and non-current portion in the finance statement preparation. So basically, this is uh, what we have discussed with respect to the accounting in the books of Lessee. So in case if any one of you have got any questions till now, do ask me so that I'll be able to answer. Because uh, there are other scenarios also, but for the time being, I have discussed this basic accounting concepts from the in the books of Lessee. So in case if anyone has got any questions till now, you are most welcome to ask them. Okay. Um, Everyone is okay till now? Every, every, everyone is okay? Are you with me be, people? I mean like are you able to understand everything? Okay, uh, Asad, uh, from the examination perspective you might not even be required to show the extracts, the examiner uh, would be probably asking in terms of discursive questions like he would be asking you, he would be expecting you to tell him that this portion is current, this portion is non-current because maybe from the examination you might get a scenario, a discursive scenario in which you just have to answer let's say that what would be the third year liability about the third year accounting etc. It could be just part of the lease that is examined, not the whole lease contract, not the whole lease term. So, okay. So I think uh, this is good enough. We have discussed about the accounting for lessee and we've also discussed about the basics of the lease agreement. And what I'm actually gonna do is that I'm just gonna keep it till here. I shall continue now in the class, which is going to be the next class. And I will conclude the lease accounting in the next class. So in case if any one of you has got any question, you are most welcome to ask or else I'll conclude the session.